same time, we will tell them what his line is. <laughs> and let's begin the general questioning with um, Steve Allen. Would any of the members here on the panel tonight... Uh, <laughs> In What's My Line, Goodson's producer, Bob Stewart, created a panel of four celebrities who would try to guess a contestant's occupation. With this masterstroke, game shows had fused with talk shows, a winning formula that would be repeated many times over. Miss Cleveland, if you'll whisper to me, we'll show the audience just what you do that keeps you so busy. The clue to Miss uh, Cleveland's secret concerns something she does, and we'll start the game with Betsy. If a panel of celebrities worked, why not install a big movie star as a game show host? It's a formula that worked just once. You bet your life. Here he is, the one, the only... Movie comedian Groucho Marx applied his ad-libbing skills to television to create one of the biggest game show hits of the era. Yes. Bezos, not Bezos. Well, when you... What did I say? You said, well, Bezos mean kisses. Kisses. But pesos mean, you know, like dollars. Oh. Well, if you have enough pesos, you can get enough Bezos. Huh? Hey, on that, could use his full range of gifts and conversational abilities and improvisation, ad lib, spontaneous, whatever you want to call it, of which he is, was of the highest order of anyone we have ever known. One of Groucho's many contestants was a struggling young comic making her first network appearance, Phyllis Diller. Yes, I've uh, worn a wedding ring for 18 years. Really? Well, two more payments and it'll be all yours. <laughs> and I was not only nervous, I was petrified. Mr. Marx was talking about his psychiatrist and I decided I'd surely better be well adjusted before I went into such a shaky business and uh, uh, so I decided I should be analyzed and I went to this analyst. He's helped me a great deal. In fact, uh, I am so much better now that I get to sit up. <laughs> <laughs> My delivery was so slow. I had, I, I looked awful. I knew nothing about makeup. I had drawn eyebrows on that would have been great on Halloween. <laughs> While it's true that Groucho quizzed his contestants and gave away small prizes, the real attraction of the show was the humor that he would extract from the situation. Well, you know, the girls usually consider it a compliment when the boys whistle at them. That's a sign of approval. I don't see how the boys could whistle at you. I should think it'd be impossible to whistle when they all have their tongues hanging out. <laughs> the next big wave in television games would stray from Groucho's approach. Far away. The result was devastating to the game show industry and the country. If you're ready, let's get into the isolation booths. By the late 1950s, game shows were the highest rated programs on television. Series like the $64,000 Challenge, 21, and Dotto attracted unprecedented audiences. Uh, may I question you once again that tonight it would be the biggest game we ever played here in the program? Producers had learned to ratchet up the drama of the games with large cash prizes, soundproof booths, and appealing contestants. The technique was so refined, they even knew exactly when to turn up the heat in the studio to ensure a contestant would dab his brow dramatically. Then you win $20,000. Congratulations. But then some producers added one more dramatic element, a predetermined outcome. 
They rigged the games to favor appealing contestants. The strategy was successful for a while, and ratings increased. Then they got caught. The first game to be exposed was Dotto. MC Jack Nars had no idea the show was being rigged until he received a late night phone call from his boss. He said, come over to my house. Would you come to my house for dinner tonight? I went over and he gave me a martini. <laughs> and then he said, I, uh, how about a second martini? I said, oh, okay. what's up? He said, don't go to work Monday. I said, what? He said, the show has been canceled. It came as a boat out of the blue for me. I had, boom, hit me right between the eyes. I went from cloud nine to the nether regions in one day. That was tough. He was stunned by it, and I was too. When he told me, I said, you're kidding. And that's everybody's first reaction. What do you mean it's off? You're kidding. Somebody gave an answer to somebody? Oh, come on. And he said, yeah. Soon, 21 was also implicated. Right after the show had installed a new host, Monty Hall. Now, when I was doing the show, I would be taken into an office. They'd take, open up a safe and show me the questions, so they'd familiarize myself with the questions, put it back in the safe, and next thing I knew, I was on the, in front of a camera doing the show with contestants. I had no idea that the contestants also saw the questions. But they did. Contestant Charles Van Doren had become a national hero. Within days, he was a disgrace. Millions were outraged. Grand juries were assembled. Perjury charges were filed. And the game shows that remained on were targets. One of the pages came over to me and said, somebody just called backstage and said that they had planted a bomb in the audience. Now this kind of thing was sort of taking place and the people were very angry at television shows for, for all of that scandal. And um, we had five minutes to go on the air and I said to him, tell the audience that every once in a while we have a prize for somebody there on the count of three, stand up, pick up your seat, and the person who sees a package there, raise your hand, will come and get it, and we're able to examine the whole theater in one minute. Those were, those were dangerous days. I mean, there's a lot of ill will going on. Congress soon passed laws to prevent further rigging, and the networks were determined to police the game show industry closely a practice that went on for many years. All the networks had a new department called Standards and Practices, S&P. And it was like a, an FBI, it was an in-house FBI. And it was really funny because they, they, at first, they were so overly protective, you would see little faces peering out from behind a set. And they're looking to see if anybody's <laughs> reading a script or looking or askance at anything. Your contestants had to be closeted in a different section of the building, and there's somebody standing there watching that you didn't have contact with them, uh, that your writers never brushed by them in the hallway, stuff like that. So we had a setup in concentration where we hired a, a guy from Scotland Yard who was backstage to to um, make sure that nobody see the stagehands who loaded the board would know the answer to the puzzle. And, and as soon as they, so they had to make sure that that didn't somehow get to a contestant who was going to come on. Um, NBC on its own hired somebody to do that. And then the, the guards clashed. They each didn't know the other was hired. And, they, and each thought the other was some kind of a spy. They wanted to make sure everything was on the up and up. Wanted to make sure no one was getting, giving one any, any signals, you know. And I would look over to, at a celebrity, for instance, on You Don't Say, I can remember. And just beyond that, in within eye shot, <laughs> there would be a little head peering around the end of the thing. We didn't score a point, but we had lots of fun that time. So Dorothy Dandridge and Peter Lawford, next name. He didn't know a feather in his hat from macaroni, the Yankee Doodle. <laughs> All right, Dorothy, first one is yours. The quiz show scandal didn't taint Mark Goodson. 
His panel shows, like What's My Line, didn't lend themselves to cheating anyway. So it was no surprise that his company developed the first big game show hit of the post-scandal era, Password. The password is backfire. Mark Goodson didn't create Password personally. Instead, that credit goes to his producer, perhaps the most inventive mind in the genre, Bob Stewart. In my opinion, you have a great game show if the person at home is talking to the screen aloud. When they, when they yell at the screen, say so-and-so, or do so-and-so, you got them hooked. Thank you. Hello, Larry. Thank you. Years earlier, Bob Stewart had created the first iteration of The Price is Right, and later, to tell the truth, Password introduced another breakthrough innovation, teaming ordinary contestants with celebrities. We saw celebrities struggling like contestants because they played exactly the same game the contestants did. It wasn't a panel of show-offs. These were people struggling to get the right word at the right time and, and win the game. And a new dimension was added to their personality as they struggled and they stripped themselves of the kind of cover that an actor uses. And that turned out to be one of the unquestionably key assets of that idea. Password was a huge hit. And a key element of the show's success was host Alan Ludden. If a contestant gave a dumb clue or something like that, he would, he would always try to be very nice about it. But he'd look at the camera with this look like, you knew what he was thinking about, you dummy, why did you say that? And I think the audience loved that. They, they loved that and they always loved copying his, whenever he gave the clue, he would always, his hands were, Alan's hands were so expressive and it was always this, people, we'd, we'd be driving down the street and somebody would recognize him and they'd say, <laughs> Certain celebrities had a natural gift for password. People like Carol Channing, Jim Backus, and of course, Betty White, who would eventually marry host Alan Ludden. By the end of the year, he began, he wouldn't say hello, he'd say, will you marry me? Well, I thought that was such a joke, I mean, it's ridiculous. One night we went to dinner and he gave me a jewelry box and I opened it and there's a wedding ring, a lovely wedding ring with diamonds all the way around. He said, you might as well where you're going to say yes sooner or later. Well, as any red-blooded American girl would do, I got mad, I got furious, and I gave it back to him, and I said, forget it, and, I, and stop pushing me. I, I'm not interested. I live in California. There was no way I was going to move to New York. But did he give it back to the jeweler? No. He put it on a chain around his neck. He wore that damn wedding ring. We'd go to the beach. There's the wedding ring. You'd see it at all times. Here it is. So in my idiocy, I wasted a whole year we could have been together. I met this lady on this game 14 years ago. I've loved every minute of it. I've worked for the best. It'll be a tough game to replace. Someday, maybe somewhere, there's another game show worthy of this kind of interest and love, but this is the best game show you can be associated with, and I'm darn grateful I had 14 lovely years with it. And thank you for supporting me. Thank you. That was seven to get you After Password hit in 1961, game shows began a renaissance. And now, here's America's top trader, TV's big dealer, Monty Hall! Created by Monty Hall and Stephen Hados, Let's Make a Deal didn't have any celebrities or quiz questions. It didn't even have much of a script. It might be behind door number one or door number two or door number three, and I come to Bob's... The game relied solely on Monty Hall's ability to build drama from indecision. I would look into her eyes and see whether I had more drama if I went to 500 or 700 or 800 and let the camera pick out her reaction. Or you can have what's in the box that Carol is showing us right now. Oh. 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 
and you're noticing the contestants' reactions because you have to play off their reactions. That's the first thing you do. You are like an amateur psychologist because you're watching the eyelids flutter and you think you know when her breaking point is. And you go to that point and no farther. Not long after Let's Make a Deal started, contestants realized that wearing a costume meant they were more likely to get picked by Monty. So NBC called us in and said, what are you going to do about this? There's 350 people out there and on your show with these crazy costumes. What are you going to do about it? And we said, nothing. You know, this is television, and that's very pictorial. It's colorful. You want all the stuff you've seen so far and the money in the pockets? At a time when most TV shows presented an all-white cast, game shows like Deal took a very different approach, showcasing a cross-section of America, real people from every demographic. We figured that Let's Make a Deal was a show that done in the audience. And this audience composition had to represent America. And so we said to our writers, when you go outside to pick the 30 or 40 people that sit in the front section, give us a cross-section of America. Of course, it proved to be the right decision. A year after Let's Make a Deal debuted, another juggernaut was launched. A game that helped make its creator one of the richest men in America. The show was Jeopardy. And the man who invented it was Merv Griffin. Griffin was no newcomer to game shows. As early as 1958, he'd hosted Mark Goodson's Play Your Hunch. My agent said, you're going for an interview with Goodson Tomlin tonight. They have seen you, and um, they are interested in you as a, a game show host. And I said, hmm, but I don't know how to do that. And I came up to this high floor in New York City at Goodson Tomlin, it was 9 o'clock at night, and the elevator door opened, and I walked out, and there was a reception room, and I sat down for a few minutes, and I went, no, 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 this is not for me. And there was nobody there, and I started and rang for the elevator, and not even my agent was there, and I, somebody came out, a door opened, and a girl came out, and she said, we'll be ready for you in just about two minutes, Mr. Griffin. And I said, ready for what? To play the game. I said, I don't know the game. No one has explained to me what your game is. She said, oh, well, go in and you'll figure it out. Starring Merv Griffin. So I walked in and I stepped up there. I started to talk and they were all laughing and screaming. And I didn't know what the game was. And by the end of this thing, they all said, you got the job. And I went, whoa. That was the strangest interview. And then I went to work on Player Hunch and loved game shows. I think you'll have fun. Here's how we score. Each time you play Hunch correctly, you get a point. Each point's worth $100. Three points wins the game for a total of $300. And more important, the right to stay on and meet new competition. So good luck to both teams. As Griffin wanted to apply all he'd learned to create his own game show. But a winning concept eluded him. The spark of the idea that would become Jeopardy finally came from Griffin's wife, Julanne. My wife said to me, I said, oh, I want to do a quiz show. And she said, well, do one. I said, you can't. They won't accept them to the network. She said, well, do one where you give them the answers. And I said, well, that's why everybody went to jail. Are you crazy? And she said, no, um, 5,280. And I said, well, how many feet in a mile? And she said, that's good. And then I went, whoa, that is a show. But then trying to put it into a game show format is the most difficult of all. Griffin spent a full year experimenting, papering his Manhattan apartment with answers scrawled on three by five cards and makeshift bulletin boards with rows of categories. A year later, Jeopardy was finally ready to pitch to the president of NBC. I just cut the backs off of envelopes and stuck the cards in there and brought in the contestants. And the president sat there and uh, the two of them and all of a sudden I ran the whole show and the president of NBC looked at me and said, I ain't got one of them. And I went, ooh, uh, well, uh, it, it, it's a difficult show, you know. But I didn't get one. And I said, well, uh, I, I can't help that, sir. That might have been the end of Jeopardy, but a young NBC executive named Grant Tinker persuaded his boss to pick up the show. Jeopardy premiered on NBC in 1964, 
and it was an immediate hit. Try it again, please, Karen. Uh, sports for 10, please. The answer is, of baseball, football, and horse racing that one that draws the largest live attendance in the United States, Karen. What's horse racing? That's right, horse racing. Lightning would strike a second time for Merv Griffin when he remembered the childhood game of Hangman and thought it might make a great game show. But it needed a gimmick. For the solution, Griffin reached back to another memory from his youth, the big spinning wheel game at the annual church picnic. Griffin had his gimmick, almost. The first uh, couple of pilots we did on it, the wheel was standing upright like this, and you smell it looked awful. Laying the wheel down made all the difference, but Merv still had one more issue to solve. When the original hostess, Susan Stafford, left to pursue her PhD. I needed a girl on the show, so I said to the, the woman who produced it, uh, please find 12 pictures, 8 by 10 glossies, put them on my desk, and I'll walk in and point to who I think. And she did that, and I walked in and just went, her, give me some tape on her talking. And it was Vanna, and that was it. Griffin had brought together the perfect combination of elements to create what would become the most profitable game in the history of the genre, Wheel of Fortune. Over $49,000 just waiting to be won today on Wheel of Fortune. Now, here's your host, John Willoughby. If a kid's game like Hangman could be morphed into a major game show franchise. Why not another childhood favorite, Tic-Tac-Toe? That was the question producers Merrill Heater and Bob Quigley pondered in early 1964, as they developed a game with a giant tic-tac-toe board and celebrities in the squares. When they mounted uh, Hollywood Squares with those nine cubicles, I saw that going up and I couldn't believe it. That was really monumental. That was the biggest, strangest, wildly different thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was so big, I thought to myself, that's got to crumble. It cannot work because it's too big, it's too, it's overdone. It was a huge success, huge success. What would you normally find a camper mounted on? A camp press. <laughs> Hollywood Squares is the most fun game show in the world. Much of the show's popularity flowed from the party atmosphere. Nine celebrities having a good time together. Karen, a parachutist hits the ground at how many miles per hour? <laughs> Did his chute open? Uh, Did the stars know the question? I'd say no. They never knew the question. They knew an area of the question, <clears throat> but they never knew the question. They might get a joke, but they never knew what the straight line was. You'd take five uh, in a day. So you'd do three shows, break for dinner, and then you would do two more. And uh, by that time, you know, they'd serve wine at dinner. So that was always interesting. At home in bed, at uh, two o'clock in the morning, you think of the greatest line that you didn't use. <laughs> That's enough to kill a person. Say, are most stolen cars recovered? I had one recovered in a zebra once. <laughs> you had Red Fox. He loved to be very body with you. And during the commercials, he would say some pretty wild things. And some people, some young girls, didn't really want to be next to him. I would always, you know, say something back to him. Hollywood Squares became so popular that celebrities often lobbied to get on the show. But some had a hard time grasping the game. Henny Youngman, for example, was an accomplished comedian. But his appearance on Hollywood Squares did not go well. I said, Henny, I'm so excited you're on the show. Now, here's the way the show works. I'll ask you a question, and if you have a joke, do it, and then get to the answer, okay? Because 20 seconds, 25 seconds, any longer is no good, okay? He said, you got it. Uh, first question was, do birds fly? He said, 
these two guys, they go bear hunting. They come to a sign that says, bear left there. So they went home. And I said, uh, Henny, uh, do birds fly? He said, uh, there was this girl in Cleveland, and, and, <laughs> and Goebel fell off his chair. And I said, we got to stop tape, guys, because he didn't get it. And Groucho didn't get it. A lot of people didn't work on the show. The celebrities who could work within the show's format often stayed on for years and became household names. Charlie Weaver, Wally Cox, Paul Lynn. Uh, according to the Red Cross, when will they stop accepting blood donations from a person? Oh, when he dries up. <laughs> hey, Paul, how many men on a hockey team? About half. Bang, that's it. There you go. Now move on. You know, that's, that's the show. You can't do a long monologue. Will humming, humming help your tennis game? <laughs> this struck me funny. Um, will humming help my tennis game? Sure, why not? It takes um. your mind off your balls or something. <laughs> and I said, yes, it'd probably take your mind off your balls. S and, and then I went, well, the audience became hysterical. Charlie Weaver got up and walked off, even though he couldn't walk very well. And it was one of those things where the laughter went on for forever, and I just had my head down on the desk. Uh, <laughs> Having fun with celebrities became a staple of the game show universe. But could a game succeed by extracting humor from the contestants? The one man who knew the answer was game show producer Chuck Barris, one of the most unusual people in American television. And when you walk into Chuck's office, you know, there's a urinal on the wall, you know, and uh, he, he was just one of, you know, it was a, he was just a, a eccentric guy. But I have nothing but nice things to say about Chuck Barris. He knew exactly what he was doing. He figured out very early that John and Mary Jones are the funniest people in the world. Oh boy! This dazzling bachelorette is a chronic disco dancer. He's here tonight to answer the musical question, can the hustle really clear up the stress in the lower track? Barris made his first big splash in late 1965 with the dating game. The show didn't have a quiz or big money prizes. Instead, it featured ordinary people having fun. Bachelor number one, I really like ice cream. If you were ice cream, what flavor would you be? <laughs> Vera soon followed up with the newlywed game, which also gleaned humor from regular folks. What animal, Lisa, did you inherit your rump from? I said her mother. What are you looking at my mother's rump for? It's not even big. You can't miss it. The thing's the size of a Buick. You can't even no, get it through the not. door. It's not. It's big. It's He's the size of a Buick. He's big boned. Barris took pride in avoiding the usual game show hosts. When Bob Eubanks was tapped for the newlywed game, he was the youngest person ever to MC a game show. After the first show, Chuck Barris came to me, and he says, I need to talk to you. I said, what's the matter? He says, you've just done something I've never seen anybody do before. That's what I do. He says, you went a half hour without blinking. So I had to write myself a note. We'll be back with more of the newlywed game. And it says, blink, that mean I go blink, blink. <laughs> That's how frightened I was. I was scared to death. See the heavy drain upon the filler resources. The newlywed game had the good fortune to premiere at the exact moment Defense Secretary Robert McNamara was addressing the nation. NBC and CBS carried the speech live. From Hollywood, here come the newlyweds! But ABC went with the newlyweds. The nation did too. That first episode had ratings to rival a Super Bowl. Both the dating and newlywed games were risque for the times, reflecting the very young and freewheeling staff that Barris had assembled. He was among the first TV producers to tap into the changing national culture of the 1960s. 
and it made Barris extremely successful. The only way game was a comedy show that happened to have a game there. And that, that's really what it is. You know, nobody talks about, you know, wow, did you see a great prize they won? Or, or, wow, they sure knew each other. No, they only talk about the funny stuff. In coins, how much money could your belly button hold? Carrie? I've never tried that. I, I guess I would say a dime. A dime. He said your belly button could hold one dollar. <laughs> He said a big old silver dollar is what he said. You're going to have to give him a ride home, too. I don't have silver dollar. He figured it out, man. He was doing reality television back then before we even knew what the word reality meant. He had great instincts. Great instincts. Barris's unique instincts came at just the right time for ABC. A perennial third place also ran. The network was in financial trouble. Newlywed game and dating game, and, and let's make a deal. I believe literally saved ABC. We took that network from here to here because every show, not only did we get that time period, but every show following us zoomed up. I remember Michael Eisner was the head of West Coast Daytime Television. He came up to me one time at a party. He says, you're very important to me. He says, you're very important to me because he realized that these three shows, Dating Game, Newlywed Game, and Let's Make a Deal, literally saved the network at the time. I remember it was so much fun going into his offices uh, because everybody was young around him. They were excited, they were exuberant. They loved what Chuck was doing. Uh, he had started with practically nothing and uh, all of a sudden, he was the king, quote unquote, of ABC. What's your idea of a dream girl? Join our new weekday game, Dream Girl of 67. And Barris's golden to touch had its limits. Many of his creations did not catch on. Shows like Dream Girl 67, The Parent Game, and How's Your Mother-in-Law, hosted by Wink Martindale. And it was called How's Your Mother-in-Law. I've had people say to me, what was the format of that show what was the concept and i've laughingly said and this may not be totally true but i said there was no concept that was the problem it wasn't all that great an idea <laughs> while a great idea is the key to a game show success another element is equally critical the mc we'll be back right after a little old pause for station identification <laughs> The job of a game show MC may be one of the most complicated in show business. Plus, the price of the trip totals $5,000 to $6,000. You will win money in the amount of the check, and you will win the trip to Atlanta. Do you have a question? A good MC has to know the game cold, monitor the clock constantly, interact effortlessly with celebrities and contestants, and constantly make adjustments to ensure the program is entertaining. In essence, the host must manufacture a half hour show every day, often with nothing more than a basic outline and a few note cards. Mark Goodson once described the game show hosting job as uh, driving a car backwards down a mountain road and being witty and funny at the same time. The skill set is basic in television and time and understanding time and then being able to put that behind you and go on with the show and be, be subconsciously aware that you have, have so much time to perform this and try to pull it off as best you can. That's the skill. And over time you acquire that skill or you don't acquire that skill. Um, and the rest of it is just kind of being funny and interesting and <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> trying not to fall down too many times. A good MC flows with the show. He is uh, compatible with the contestants. He's on their side. He likes to see people win. And without thinking, without trying, without being at all mechanical, you just become a part of the show and let it flow. In the early years, comedians were often tapped to host game shows. People like Johnny Carson, Groucho Marx, 
and even Dick Van Dyke, who auditioned to be the first host of The Price is Right. Yes, they, when they were putting together The Price is Right back in the, in the, this is in the late 50s, they asked me to be the host, and I kept telling my wife, this is a show about guessing how much something costs. Th that's a game show? She said, it'll never go. Over time, producers learned that many traditional comedians weren't quite right for the MC job. Instead, hosting a game show would require a very different set of skills. The whole secret is to listen. If you listen to what the contestant is saying, then go and make something from it. Creating spontaneous entertainment, it's like mining for gold. You find this wonderful little contestant or big contestant or whatever, and you go with that person and get that audience laugh. There's nothing like that. I would have to watch myself because there were so many openings for jokes and things. And I said, no, 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 Pete. You're the straight man. Just stay right where you are. As with many professions of the era, women were often overlooked as potential game show MCs. In 1949, Arlene Francis briefly hosted a program called Blind Date, but for nearly 40 years, women were shut out. TV producers recognized Betty White's potential as an MC, but the networks refused over and over. The network said, no, a, a, a woman just can't, she, she can't hold a show together and she, she just doesn't have, it just doesn't work with a woman, you know. White finally got her chance to MC on a game called Just Men. She won an Emmy, but the show was quickly canceled. Then they started doing research. They said, we have research. You know, they love to do research. We have research that says that women are basically in love with the guys that host game shows, that it's like a romantic, a fantasy romance connection. Despite the research, Vicki Lawrence was hired to host Win, Lose, or Draw. She faced unique challenges because the producers wouldn't let her wear skirts. They thought suits would give her more authority. And, you know, I do not have Vanna White's body, so some days the stuff would not work. And my wardrobe gal and I would be peeing in our pants because it would look so horrible on me, so we'd have to go on to the next suit, see if we could make that work, you know? And then the, and then the booth would be calling, going, where's that red suit? She's supposed to be in that red suit. Well, the red suit didn't fit over her left thigh, so we had to move on to the blue suit, you know? Who was the best MC of the pioneering era? Bob Barker has the most awards and greatest longevity. But for sheer versatility, one other name appears on every insider's list. But there was one guy who was good at everything he ever did. And you know why? Because he was very natural. He, uh, he was very polite. He loved his, his contestants and the other people. And his name was Bill Cullen. Actual retail value, $332.94. Mr. McCaig, it is yours. Oh, You've just seen the most torrid love scene on television, and we're going to lose our television license, too. Bill Cullen was so good that it's hard to describe. He was velvet. Bill was very different. He was very self-deprecating. Bill also was very, very bright and laughed easily. And isn't it pleasant to be around people who laugh easily? This also has a prescription tabletop. You knew it was Bill Cullen. It wasn't, this wasn't a, a pasteboard cutout. Bill was the best. He had uh, a great sense of humor. He had style. He had uh, panache. He had, he had everything. This is Bill Cullen saying thanks for watching and keep your minds working quick as a flash. Good night, everybody, and thanks, panel, for being with us. Good night. Game shows can earn a lot of money and make their participants famous. But that's not why most game show pioneers got involved in the form. Instead, at the most basic level, they like playing games. The challenge, the competition, the fun. Our next contestant is none other than David Jensen. I began to realize that games have been around forever. And I have loved them forever. I fell in love with the game. I love the game of Password. Let's face it, people love to play games. People love to see people win. I love the people. 
I'm a people person, and so I don't care if they jump on me, and I don't care if they yell and they faint, but if those are my people. You're not doing something like curing cancer or anything. You're just having, having fun and making, giving people 30 minutes of entertainment. Game shows give the public a chance to get to know you as you as a person because you're not playing a role or not singing a song. You're speaking for yourself in your own voice so they, they feel that they know you a lot better than if you're in a movie or in a television show. Now, Eddie, I think I'm a pretty good judge of character, so what kind of illegitimate business are you in? <laughs> audience laughed and it startled me. I thought, oh, that's a beautiful sound. I'm going to see if I can get them to do that again. And I've been doing it for 50 years. We're going to stop this film cold. Oh, is that right? No. For more than 50 years, we've been watching game shows, playing along, joining the party. Your mind's working quick as a flash. Good night, everybody, and thanks, panel, for being with us. Thanks to the pioneers of television.